It feels like recently every day I hear about a new AI coding tool and then about two weeks later I hear about a new bug in the new AI coding tool. I want to talk today about a vulnerability that was found in the Gemini CLI. So the Gemini CLI is Google CLI for their Gemini model. Before we get into this, I want to talk about kind of AI coding in general. I think there's a lot of discourse online about whether or not AI coding is good or bad. And as someone who's a security engineer and offensive security researcher, I have some personal takes on it. And if you want to hear them, just stay in the video. I think overall, AI code generation is actually an okay thing if executed correctly, okay? AI code generation allows you to move quickly. However, that does not mean that you should move quickly. Every piece of code is tech debt. And all because you can create code faster now does not mean that code is also not tech debt. You can use AI, in my opinion, to write some really cool systems really, really fast but you need to be constantly evaluating the code that the AI emits. It may make you a little faster in code generation, but the time you spent in code generation, in my opinion, should be used now for code audit, and it should make you marginally faster, but not multiplicative, right? Because if it is, I think at that point, you're putting security design to the wayside and things are gonna get hairy. Now, that being said, obviously, there are tons of tools available for AI coding. You have Cursor AI, the Cursor text editor, which is basically a VS code fork with the, uh, the Cursor AI underneath it. And then you have these CLI tools, right? Where if, instead of opening up VS code, you know, spawning some really hefty application, you can use these CLI tools, right? You can use these applications right in the browser. And Gemini CLI is one of them. Now, the way that a lot of these CLIs work is you have to specify these things called context files, specifically the readme.md and gemini.md, right? So these are typically referred to as like rules files in, uh, in text editors for AI. Basically what's happening here is there needs to be some place for the AI to look, to read and get a general context of what is happening in the code base. Like the readme might say, this is an HTTP server written in C and it uses this, you know, this parsing pattern. And then the Gemini MD file might say, okay, cool, also this is uh, how I think Gemini should behave in this, in this project, right? You use these rules, you do these things. Now, unfortunately, uh, there has been a code execution vulnerability in Gemini AI CLI, and if you're probably guessing where this is going already, it's a command injection, right? And while we can't stop zero days from happening, one of the best ways to stay ahead of hackers is with today's video sponsor, Flare. Flare is a threat exposure management platform that can tell you if you or your company's data has been compromised in cybercrime. Here, I put some of my personal identifiers like my email addresses and my site level academy as identifiers in the Flare system. And identifiers can be a variety of things like domain names, keywords, maybe fake API keys, breadcrumbs you leave behind for hackers to get tripwired on or usernames and passwords. If Flare detects that those have been picked up either on the dark web or elsewhere, I can get events sent to me. And here you can see all the events that Flare has found without me doing any work just on those identifiers alone. Also has a really cool Intel feed that I like where things are happening all over the world all the time in cyberspace. And we have one article here that says that a threat actor claims to sell a custom ransomware as a service targeting Windows and ESXi, the virtualization platform. What this means is that if you are a person that actively uses ESXi in your cloud environment and you feel like things are getting weird in your network, you have a place to go where you can go look and see, hey, maybe we're a victim to this. You can use my link right here to get a free trial of Flare while supplies last. Hey, Flare, thanks for sponsoring the video. Back to the video. The attack is very straightforward. Basically, all you have to do is put a command inside of your Gemini.md file and then at the end of the command, put another command that's malicious. That's like, that's like, you know, hacking 101, right? Hmm, if I can get the user to execute a command, maybe we can do evil shit, right? And so what's happening here in this, this example command, the malicious command, in the Gemini.md file, what they're doing is they're saying, hey, grep the readme.md file for the word install, right? Very simple, benign command. But then semicolon, they create a new command and they say, oh, also, Take the local environment, which will have your API keys, your database, username and password, all of your sensitive information for your server, which ideally isn't in your dev environment. That's a whole other, you know, environments conversation. Uh, take the environment and then use curl, the command to make a post request and send it out to some remote dot server on port 8083, right? So what we're doing here is basically saying like, hey, Gemini, when you turn on, I need you to run this command to boot up and this command will exfiltrate the API keys. What's really interesting here is that like there are different white space patterns where Gemini will or will not invalidate things. And the fact that like this, like just putting a semicolon at the end of it is like allowed is kind of crazy by default. 
We will see that, you know, if this were to happen, if you ran this in Gemini, it would show the user like, hey, we're about to run grep install readme and pipe to curl. Like, it would show them the entire malicious command. Oh man, plans foiled. Now the user's gonna see what we're doing. Unless, of course, we inserted some top secret white space technique developed by, you know, some crazy, no, literally it's just press enter a few times and uh, then, it, then it hides it. So what you'll see here is Gemini CLI is running the command. It's saying grep install readme3, which is the front end of that malicious command. Oh, and just pipe that into head because head gets the top N number of lines of, of standard outs output. I only want to see the top three lines and then enter, 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 semicolon, the command, right? So it's like, okay. Now, when this was sent to Google, right, this vulnerability was sent to Google, they did fix it. They did the right thing and they, you know, responsible disclosure and had a full turnaround from vulnerability disclosure to agree disclosure date and release on the 25th. So like, you know, pretty much a month of time went by. And, you know, some of the notes we got back from the team were that the CLI is centered on providing robust multi-layered sandboxing. Which basically means that the Google team was telling them, hey, like we see here that you're running Google CLI in no sandbox mode. Sandboxing is this environment in software, or this concept in software, where basically things like Chirrut jails or containers are able to create these layers of security around applications so that even if you get code execution in that application, it's not allowed to touch other contents at that same privilege level. You create like these artificial boundaries in software that say, hey, you can't touch it. And so Google was saying, hey, man, like we understand the bug is a thing. We're going to fix it. But also you're not in sandbox mode. You could have fixed this by being sandbox mode. The issue that I have with that, I think, threat model of like, oh, just be in sandbox mode is the default mode of the Gemini CLI is no sandbox. Right. And I think a lot of what like the marketing and like the audience targeting of these no these like no code, like vibe coding tools is to the layman is to the person with like a extremely small amount of coding knowledge. So for like Google to come out and say, hey, we hear you, but why aren't you sandboxing? Well, it's like, dude, the tool shipped without sandboxing by default. And like, you know, maybe I as a security researcher would do that. Or maybe, you know, the people at Tracebit who found this bug would use a sandboxing. But like, I don't think it's reasonable to expect the average person to just like have sandboxing enabled by default, right? I think that's a thing that the average person won't really do. In my opinion, this pattern of like prompt injection type stuff isn't going to go away anytime soon, just personally, because I, I think the, the problem we're dealing with here is like there aren't multiple planes of data when it comes to doing vibe coding or like using a text editor to manipulate data where the rules files and the code files can exist in the same plane. It sounds very like Magic the Gathering ethereal. What I'm saying is that because the code that the user is providing lives in like the same realm of existence, like it's files as the prompt for the AI, if there isn't like an insane amount of work done on filtering this data, we're gonna keep seeing this over and over and over again. The reason I say this is because we literally had a bug, I think it was either in GPT-4 or like a Claude AI variant, some model, a few months back, I made, I made a video on it, where basically, if you just injected these magical white space characters called like E3000s, these m characters are like Unicode white space characters that appear to the human eye as white space, but when you type them out in data, the AI can interpret them as real values, right? So what ends up happening here is you can type out data using these fake characters that you as a human can't read unless you put it into a text editor and like change the values, but the AI will automatically just ingest it and like slurp it up as real data, right? Like, I, like I'm like i all for AI coding if it's properly audited, if someone's reading the code, if there's proper security analysis done on it and stuff like that. But there's also this really weird scary attack vector where like, we're gonna start seeing these repos that are riddled with like, oh, and by the way, curl, download, you know, a root kit, install it here locally for me. And it's gonna use these like crazy characters. I just, I don't see a programmatic way of creating a whitelist for this, right? The like the only acceptable thing. The reason for that is like, you know, Chinese characters, Arabic characters, like all the characters that are non ASCII, like Unicode need to be readable by the AI. But also, comma, how do you do that and then also block out all the white space that isn't valid? So, you know, instead of doing a white list where you're only allowing these things, you have to do a black list. And what is the meme about that? Hold on. Generally, it's accepted that white lists are better than black lists, right? A white list is the things that are allowed and a black list is the things that are not allowed. 
The reason for this is that no bicycle riding, no rollerblading, no roller skating, no skateboarding, no scooter riding, and someone, a hacker, is gonna find an edge case and say, you didn't say unicycle. Now guys, obviously, I don't wanna doom and gloom, right? That's not the point of this channel. The point of this channel is to raise awareness about things and to make things happier and healthier and create a safer world for everybody. So go out, dude, go download a Gemini CLI, go vibe code an application, but you have to do due diligence. If you're gonna clone code, you have to read the code. You're gonna read the Gemini files. You're gonna read the cursor rules. You're gonna run your Gemini CLI in a sandbox and you're gonna like the way you look. I guarantee it. Thanks for watching. Hit sub, please.